Friday with Very weird. Really How weird. is everyone tonight? I'm Bill uh, from CNC Router yeah. Tips Group, um, having our weekly meeting, weekly get together. Um, uh, how is everyone today? Good. How about you? Doing doing a lot better. I uh, I had a, a a cold out last week from uh, my trip to uh, Miami. Uh, sore throat and you know coughing and congestion, but uh, got that all taken care of. Uh, thankfully, not COVID. Life is good. Thanks for the auto notify, Bill. Uh, you're welcome. You're, you're welcome. Um, so for those who are watching this inside of the Facebook group, if you'd like to join us, I will drop a link into the comments so that you can do that. Um, it hey, is wrong? always a pleasure <laughs> to, to get together with everybody um, every week when we do this. And, um, you know, it's it's nice. Today we have a... a a topic that we'll get to in in a moment as soon as we catch up on where everybody what everybody's doing and um you know so far this week and we'll we'll get right into the uh, the topic so uh let's see meetings and dropping that link inside of the inside of the facebook group um all right copy invitation there we go Now, um, Jen, what's going on in your uh, in your neck of the woods? Who, who was that you asked? John. Oh, okay. Uh, I was working on it. It was charcuterie boards, and uh, today I was out in the, out in the shop. I'm getting uh, the hard top for my '59 Corvette re ready to paint. So I was out there. Getting the fiberglass all straightened out and everything and primed. I, I got it primed tonight. So tomorrow, hopefully, I'll paint it. How long have you been working on that? Uh, I just got the hardtop uh, about uh, three weeks ago and I ordered all the parts for it to re restore it. So I just, this past week, I've just started working on the, the body work on it because they had put a vinyl top on it. And I had stripped that off and had all that glue and everything. And so then I had to strip it off and I skim coated the body filler and locked it all out. And now it's got three coats of primer on it. And tomorrow I'll shoot it with the base coat clear coat. Mm -hmm. What kind of spray gun are you using? I have a uh, the Billis uh, HVLP. It's the, the pro, the Bill's mm -hmm. pro. Yeah, I'm kind of in the, uh, I'm at that point where I need to consider getting a decent spray gun. So that's mm -hmm. that's nice. I'm glad to, that was one one of the ones that I was considering. So um, thanks for yeah, that. It's a, it's the, it's a, uh, the other one I have is a uh, Tenka, T-E-N-K-A, I believe it is. And that's, I think it's made by DeBillis or it's an offshoot of DeBillis. And that's another good, you know, they're not super, super expensive. You know, I mean, 300 and some dollars, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like uh, 1500 <laughs> you know. Yeah. Or like, and or like and it's, it's, the, it's the HVLP one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's all I shoot anymore is HVLP. Even my airbrushes are, you know the uh small you know they only <clears throat> add pound of pressure on them yep. oh myron how how, uh, how about you what are you up to i'm busy as heck man all kinds of stuff going on we uh we did our first craft show uh saturday and and just had a really big big turnout for that and that was awesome and just you know just trying to keep up with uh with all the orders and stuff we got from that. And I ordered one of those, uh, one of those little, uh, what is it, a uh, galvanic laser, I guess they're called. I ordered mm -hmm. one of those today 
And uh, so we're going to be setting that up um, when that comes in. We'll be setting that up at some craft shows and stuff and, and being able to laser some stuff, you know, personalize some stuff right there uh, at the show. So that's kind of exciting uh, to be able to get that. And, and uh, but I, we've just been busy, 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 man. I'm curious, are you um, leaving your um, equipment out there where folks can see and, you know, maybe spawn your uh uh, folks who want to do the same thing in your area or what are you how are you dealing with that i'd say that again so somebody walks by they see your galvanic laser and they say hmm i should get one of those and well you know, you know i i wanted to ever since i got a diode i thought man this would be cool to set up at a craft show uh but the diodes are pretty slow you know <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to personalize at a craft show, you got to be relatively quick with it, you know? And so I was going to buy a fiber laser and I talked to, uh, I talked to Bull Shanigan yesterday, he called me and I ran it by him and he said, man, he said, okay, so he said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be I carrying a fiber laser around to shows and stuff like that. Um, you know, what we so, want to put in them and two possible Afternoon, gentlemen, or good morning. Hey, Ned, how are you? Hey, good, good, good. Well, uh, we're, we're just uh, saying hello and telling what we've been up to lately, and then we're going to get into the topic for today, which is uh, uh, going to be paying off your skin. I don't think that I don't think that ever ends. No, but. Yeah, it's 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 a good topic to have. Oh, I just walked in on the end of the Galvo, etc., and I thought that actually you, you did have a fiber laser with the Galvo, but I take it you've just put a Galvo on your CO two or um, diode laser. But uh, I do agree with Bull. I think the a fiber laser with Galvo at a trade show would be a brilliant thing. Yeah, I hope so. I just bought the I bought that X X Tool F one is the one I bought, and then I bought the uh, I bought the Jackery one thousand power supply with it, and I bought all the accessories. I got the rotary, the extension table, the air filtration so you, system. And so it was you got all, a five, so that was fiber, or was that like was that just no? The that's a Galvo. It's the it's the okay. X Tool one, and okay, yeah. um and. And so the whole package with the power supply was almost as much as the laser, you know. So um, with the Jackery power supply and everything included, it was tax and everything was about thirty three hundred. So not not too bad. Okay. Hey, and, how you, and how do you find that now, like with uh, compared to having it on um, on the X Y rails sort of thing? I, I don't know. I I haven't gotten it yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Was that? Right. Yeah, I, I'll, I, you know, I hope I didn't make the three thousand dollar mistake, you know. So we'll see. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> just for a little bit of clarity, uh, Myron was talking to me a while back, and man, you blew me away when you got it because showing me that you ordered it because it, that one should be a good one. I've been watching that for a while, but Ned, the Galvos are so much faster, but the reason is, is because you have a smaller cutting area on, on those machines, but on a regular fiber laser, you can change that lens. So anybody who's considering getting a fiber or something like that, think deeply about your cut size, which uh, will help you with your deciphering of power. Like I only have a 30 watt because the 60 watts was an additional $3,500 to go into that next stage. Um, so what I did is, <coughs> figured for metal you got to remember what laser light is right we are obliterating other molecules of materials with sheer heat it's like a miniature pulsating torch uh in there 
Uh, so we can change up the lens to be a smaller area, concentrate that beam closer to our material and still gain the same power. Uh, well, we would be at a different power level, but we would, but our max power could do something equivalent to what maybe a 60 watt could do at a lower power setting. If that makes any sense. It, it sort of doesn't really because um, it's my under, well, with a, I assume you're talking about a CO2 laser. It's my right. understanding. Well, you already, oh, it's just a diode about laser. Fiber lasers. Oh, fiber lasers. Okay. Yeah. I'm talking about fiber lasers. And now there's a new breed of lasers that are out, which are diode lasers and CO2 lasers, because really a fiber laser is a CO2 laser. Instead of sending the beam through the air and bouncing and reflecting that beam to a smaller point, <laughs> we are taking that power and sending it through a fiber optic uh, to condense that power in there. So the new ones are diode CO2s but they're not really CO2. So what they're doing is they're taking multiple di from my understanding, if anybody knows, um, I'm open for an education. Uh, yeah, they're I, don't know, they're I don't know everything. You know, I'm just going off of my own research. But nowadays what they're doing is they're taking multiple 10 watt or 20 watt diodes and they're putting them through a prism to coalesce the two focal points to make a higher output level. They're, mul they're multiplexing the diodes. Yeah. So, uh, and- And the, the proper term is uh, column. And, and the Col one well, that, yeah. it, It's called what? That's the right idea. Bill? Yeah. It's what, called what palimating mean? the beam, getting all the light to a column. There, there's the word. I, thank you, thank you. I, 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 I'll, I'll have to check that. I'll, I'll, I'll like, I think that could be actually wrong. That's actually converging the beam, but to actually align them into the one beam should be well, could be wrong. Well, should be uh, multiplexing, one, and then you culminate it. But anyway, yeah, that's yeah. The the model that Myron got actually has two types of lasers in it. One is a diode that is being uh, that is going through another prism point to increase its power. And then there's another type of laser that's like a, it's like an air cooled CO2, except it's really, really low watts. It's like maybe five, 10 watts. But because of that focal distance, he'll be able to mark on metal without needing some type of spray marking like you do with normal CO2s. Or so they claim that, I mean, they're showing videos uh, uh, of it and uh, doing its thing. And I, I do have to say uh, out of all of the uh, smaller portable laser, X-Tool does have one of the more appealing products. Uh, but yeah, Myron was asking me about moving my fiber around to shows and I'm I don't know. I'm just like I'm not comfortable with risking as much as I paid for my fiber to move it around at a show and something winds up happening uh to it versus uh you know using something smaller like a portable diode. And, and this X tool one the model he bought is actually designed for mobilization because it even comes with its own battery or, or you can buy the extended battery pack right myron yeah but the battery pack is is from jackery which is a they're, they're a, they've been around for about 10 or 11 years and that's that's all they do they do the the battery backup units and then they have the ones that are solar charged as well and so i went to jackery i was going to buy that 
I was going to buy that separate from Jackery, but it was a couple hundred dollars less for me just buying it all through X Tool. So they partnered with Jackery on that. And um, it looks like I'm going to get about eight hours out of the computer, the laser, and the air cleaner at one time. So I, I look forward to hearing your results, man. I, I, it, I'm, I'm really, really impressed that you bought that. Because uh, when I was talking with you, I was thinking, you know, just get yourself like a little tiny atom stacker for a hundred bucks. If all you're going to be doing is laser engraving some leather or some wood, something simple. Uh, yeah, because you hadn't, you you hadn't know, categorized the ticket hadn't been categorized at all. That's why it wouldn't let you take it. Yeah, you know, I think we're going to do fine with it. Yeah. Oh, Somebody's yeah. got their TV on, I think. And, and you can do glass on it, too. Actually, that was quite impressive. I saw that um, they cut through around about uh, a four or five millimeter pane of glass in something like around about three passes, uh, three or four passes, and it just dropped the centerpiece straight out. That was actually very impressive for me. Uh, the, the thing that caught my eye about it was the one pass quarter inch uh, pure bond uh, fly. That's what caught my eye using the dio setting because uh, as far as I know, I haven't seen any diodes doing a quarter inch apply in one pass. Uh, and if you and if any of you guys ever used any diodes and you you know if you're taking more than two passes, Man, you're always going to be fought, fighting those uh, flames and that smoke. Yeah. yeah, and the char marks are really the char marks get really bad. Yeah, you know, and I'm even my my little my little twenty will cut quarter inch, but barely. Um, it'll cut eighth inch really nice. Yeah, um, so it cuts, it cuts that three millimeter real well. Um, but um, I see where X Tool's got a forty watt diode coming out now. And so I'm thinking that's going to be it for cutting that quarter inch in one pass. Well, I think that will uh, do it. I'm uh, leery about when they go past 20 watts. Now, any of you guys who are electrical can probably answer this better than me. But from what um, I've read, that even though they say 10 power, 10 watts of power, they're yeah. only seven watts of output. Yeah, that, that, that's a bit of deceptiveness. I've started noticing um, that, that they're starting to use yeah, they're starting to use the actual power consumption rather than what the diode power is. And the I, I can't remember her name, the lady, I think she's from Florida that does the concrete cutting. She just said, I think that's a little bit um, high, but I think she just typed in chat that it's uh, hers cuts two inches per 40 watt. Correct. Yes, the 40 watt. You got a two forty inch. watt diode that cuts two inches. That's the X tool, two inch lumber. Go ahead and uh, take a look at it on uh, YouTube. Actually, what? is that a single, uh, single or multi pass? I want to say it's single. I haven't tried it. I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't Dude. tried to do. To what do kind the of lumber? Inch. What kind of lumber are we talking here? Balsa um, water. I, I, it's a, like a two by two. I don't, I can't say if it's a softwood or a hardwood. Yeah, but it's I gotta be know. a softwood. I yeah, do I mean, know it's a, and, and, and it's, it's actually gotta be fossil wood. I, I just can't yeah. see yeah. a beam staying uh, yeah, the, together. If you look at the, years. the, if you take a look at the YouTube that, that introduces the 40 watt, I bought the 40 watt. I bought also the IR, which is the one that marks on the metal and also the 20 watt. I started off with the 20 watt with the, the X tools and then I bought the IR and then the, the 40 watt and the 40 watt. I just got like maybe a month ago, so I haven't I haven't personally tried to cut two inch, but on the YouTube videos, it does show that it cuts up to two inches, and it looks like a regular piece of a regular piece of lumber. Yeah, the, the problem with those diode, the higher power diodes, when you start cutting through thicker materials, it doesn't cut straight. It goes off, and it gives you a bigger curve. So that's that's pretty much the same with any 
Yeah. Measure them. So you you the, see them. Um, yeah. Uh, I have a, a, con, uh, a concave surface mm -hmm. uh, yeah. on the edge of the wood. Yeah. And the so other the thing is, when you get up to the <laughs> higher power diodes, they don't engrave as well either. Yep. Now, this is a yeah, CNC that's router the, that's the uh, with them is, discussion is the tonight. Lower, so we're going to be moving wattage, they, they engrave on much better. from the laser in this video and give you some information uh, tonight okay <laughs> so i know this is a great topic but that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. yeah i read that we're going to talk about paying off our machine i'm very interested in this yeah so we got just a couple more people to say hi uh introduce <laughs> tell us what they're up to and then we'll move into that yeah so wade yeah. how about you where what's what's going on I'm from Truro, Nova Scotia, and uh, yeah. I do a bunch of CNC work and uh, nice mostly woodworking. Um, I have a 3D printer and a laser too that I've only used a couple times. And, mm -hmm. You know, but the, the CNC seems to be the big thing for me. Welcome. Oh, fantastic. Welcome. Uh, Mark, how about you? Uh, just some CNC work. Uh, uh, did some spool boards. Resurfacing them this week. I was looking at buying a 520 HD, but <clears throat> after running it down, it ended up in a HD4. He was trying to sell it as a 520, which is a lot of difference between them two machines. They're, they're all next wave. Mm -hmm. As far as lasers, I haven't really. Again, yeah, you too. I haven't got that much in the laser yet. I got a seven watt laser that I got from next wave, but. I haven't used it yet. I got to set it up and experiment with it. That's pretty awesome. much it for me. Uh, did we get everybody? Mike, did you uh, did you say hi and uh, yep. talk about what's Hi, hi guys. Um, no, I'll, I've, I've been working on some uh, drawings for um, my next hand carvings and a couple of three D models that I'm just playing around with. So. Nothing, nothing too exciting, um, and and I I have a five watt and a one watt laser, I mean diode laser, and they're they're both awesome for engraving, but yeah, they don't cut shit. Excuse my French. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, venturing into the subject for just long enough to say that I have a thirty watt CO two uh, that probably cuts it around twenty two uh, watts. It's just not going to output what is yeah. made. Yeah. Mark uh, Jensen. Awesome. Hey, hey, Bill. Good evening. Good morning, guys. Um, I dived into making my own router bits. There's the case for it that I 3D print. It's for tiling. And it's got a point on the end for finding the edge, X, Y, and Z. And then you flip it over and you use it for your, through your machine. You pull it through. So I've been making those and uh, bought a whole bunch of equipment and cranking them out. You and selling them? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Give us the link. I was, about, I was about to say, please explain some more. Oh, so when you go through a machine and you want to move the uh, tile, I actually have the machine with this bit drop in your quarter inch hole, and then the machine moves the, uh, the material for me. And I've uh, got my club uh, guys testing out, and they really love it because you're within a couple of thousandths of an inch or fractions of a millimeter uh, because the machine actually does the movement, not the human moving it. And then you reclamp it, and uh, you can do infinite moves that way, and uh, you can make a seamless tiling. Yeah, I know nice. a lot of the commercial machines will do that, like the BSE and the, um, et cetera. They'll, they have it set up so that the machine tractor. actually positions it. Tractor feed uh, or side feed. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, this is a lot cheaper, Bill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Mark, yeah. About $250,000 cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, Mark, you have Facebook? Yeah, I'm on the I'm on this group. Yes. If you uh, if 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 you message me, I'd be interested in one of them. Uh, who is speaking? <laughs> Myron. Okay. Should be easy to find. There's not another spelling like that of that of my name anywhere, I don't think. All righty. It's a Me, uh, I I second that. I'm under Enrique Elizondo, which is my husband. 
Okay, I'll look it up here when we're done talking. But that's that's oh, something I kind of uh, went off, uh, Bill and, and guys, um, off to the side and no, that's started fine. doing this. Um, uh, throw, just throw a link into the comments in the Facebook um, group uh, under this uh, broadcast, and folks will be yeah, absolutely. Yep, yeah, I'll do that, and then you guys can. Um, yep. Can you just explain what you're doing with that bit? Is that like a diamond drag bit or like um, I, I, I didn't quite understand what you're doing with it? It's for tiling and it's got a point on it. And some of the guys actually use it. It's a, it's a high speed steel bit that I'm actually machining. Uh, let's see. I can't even see myself. Just a second here. I put a 60 degree point on it. Put your hand behind it. Then, then we'll be able to see it. I'm too close. So I, I, I sort of get the gist. So it's basically a, a tapered, tapered to a point. But when you say tiling, what like are you cutting tiles or? No, uh, a tiling operation within the CNC milling is when you cut a area, and then you move it by X amount, and you cut another area, and that's continuous. So, like in my example, I have a, a HD. Uh, uh, three five which is a 510 so i only have 25 inches of uh, square inches of working space and if i want to cut a four foot long sign i have to tile it where i move it in sections along as i'm mm. routing and like bill was saying that a lot of the you know quarter million dollar machines and that actually move the material for you through your open access there's always one open access or or so on the machine mm -hmm. so this bit allows you to very accurately find your your point and then you flip it over uh, okay and, gotcha and, yeah and you and you bore it's not something you run with it's something you actually use for movement along a straight edge or uh, what it's have for you alignment basically alignment. And relocation yep. uh, on there it's it's a uh it's kind of the same the, the thing as, as we do machining for relocation pins yep like so styles like basically a, a stylus that you line up on okay yep um the, the funny thing is that uh the guys uh here in the midwest use this to uh scratch uh because they're too cheap to buy the diamond bits and they mm -hmm. buy these from me and they're uh, scratching acrylic to do their led signs with it and then when they're dull they give them back to me this is a rockwell 60 63 ish 64 mm -hmm. And then when they're dull, I put them back in the lathe. I five C them up, and I cut a <laughs> cut a fresh edge for them. And give it back to them. So it's multi use. Yes, multi use. There we go. Yeah. I, I looked up that laser. I watched that video for that 40, 40 watt one, and it said the guy showed cutting a two by four, but he said he did it in seven passes, and it didn't seven. Actually, yeah, it didn't actually cut all the way through it. But he showed. I got you. Yeah, uh, one pass would have been impressive. <laughs> yeah, very, very. Maybe impressive. with a water jet, but no. <laughs> with a lot of air assist. One, one pass on two inch would be impressive with a 300 watt, I think. <laughs> yeah. They made it, the, the video I saw made it seem a whole lot more impressive, of course, but that was an <clears> advertisement <throat> when they were first coming out with it. The, the biggest problem um, with all the lasers and the thickness that they can cut is the actual focal point. So if you wanted to cut something thick, you would actually have to have like a, like particularly a 50 mil, you'd have to have something like a 500 mil or one meter focal point. So your actual lens would have to be a fair way off the material so you can get that convergence of the beam through your material so you can focus the power. And I even question that, or you'd have to step down the um, the focus of the laser for each cut pass. So yeah, oh, okay. yeah. And, and that has its own problems as well. Right. Yeah, and one, one technique that they used to use back in the old days was they would actually set the focal length so that it, um, the beam was um, the dot, if you will, the, the focal point mm -hmm. was actually below the surface of the part so that it would cut wider at the at the at the top surface of the wood and then narrow down as it got deeper towards towards the point but that oh nice then that led you to have um edges that weren't good gotcha. things like that so then they began using air assist to try and 
you know, help that problem. And, you know, there's right. just so many different ways that, that we're trying to skin this cat. Um, right. So, so, now, so now you cut it on the router and engrave it on the laser. Yeah. Um, on the on that same website, I'm looking at the X1, their head, their Z goes up and down. So they're allowing to carve this bowl by, by changing the focal point. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Oh, okay, yeah. that's on the F one. Yeah, I haven't gotten into those. Um, the the P two and the F one, I think it was, but the P two to me is the same as the IR. the The one that they they say that is, uh, you can take anywhere you want. That might be the. I don't know which one that is, but it does the metal engraving. Um, I think that's the same thing as the IR laser that they have because they're the same wattage and everything. I'd, I'd actually be careful with what they say with metal engraving. Generally, metal engraving means that you have to coat the surface. Well, yeah, this one, this one, you're not supposed to have to coat the surface. Um, it's it's supposed to do. Um, the the metal engraving without having to coat it and but it won't do any cutting of course and it's particularly made just for metal engraving but it does a that's, that's a fiber this was done on a fiber this is heat treated stainless steel that i did today playing, beautiful playing with annealing so that i can bring out different colors colors right. can be produced with only a fiber, not the IRs, because the IRs are really nothing more than CO2. And anyway, yeah, anyway, the IRs are they're, they're claiming that you Bill's can plan. get like, they're claiming let's, let's on the get IR on topic with Bill. Yep. All kinds of colors. Back to Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Baba. <laughs> yeah. Now in this episode of uh, CNC Lasers. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was the name Beba. Beba, yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> I just remembered. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> so, show of hands. Uh, who here owns a router, a CNC router? I do. Okay, we all do. And if you don't mind saying, how much did you spend for your router? The, I, I built mine. I bought. I built a Gatton. And I got, uh -huh. got two grand in it, and I can do. A 43 by now you're just bragging 36 okay <laughs> about two grand all right. all right how about you mark got about five thousand a month yeah uh mike uh about eight eight yeah ned well i'm a diy and i'm about as frugal as they come um i've pretty much scavenged a lot of stuff and so on i don't i've i've uh, probably got about i've got four cnc routers and i don't think i spent much over three thousand dollars for them for each or for all of them <laughs> for all of them yeah mm -hmm. well So I want to know I own, how to pay pay mine. I own uh, two routers. Which uh -huh. one do you want? Just, both we're people. just at, we're getting figures out there, guys. Uh, well, if you want just figures, then I have an aluminum DIY that was built almost ten years ago for around forty two hundred dollars. Okay, and, and how about your kit. other machine? And the other one was an experiment from could I build a CNC router from Home Depot in a box store, mm -hmm. which we did with a uh, Okay, and how much was that? That <laughs> total uh, was- uh, $3,000, thank you. Six. Next, moving on to Wade. <laughs> I, I have uh, okay. two machines. First machine I built, paid about $5,000 for it. Then I put a an ATC on it and then, uh, I played with that and then I bought a legacy CNC and the legacy is used. It's about six years old and I paid 8,000 for it, but this is Canadian funds too. Right. So. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Mark. 5,000. 5,000. Uh, Myron. 3,000. Yeah. Bella. <coughs> uh, retail 25. Uh, what I actually paid all together because I had to have it. Um, 
do like a rebuilt on it. So 95. Mm -hmm. Scott. Nine, nine, five, not 95, nine, five. Okay. 9,500. Yes. That might just be lurking, listening to us. Yeah. Um, Scott often has intermittent, um, uh, cell, cell coverage. Okay. My, my whole point of that was asking down <coughs> the range is wide. We're anywhere from three to, to 20, $25,000 that we've got invested in these routers. Okay. In, in my case, uh, when I built my router the first time, it was about 3000 bucks. But by the time I ended up adding uh, aluminum pieces and replacing all kinds of things, I'm probably at somewhere around five grand because, you know, I'm a DIY guy, did it myself. So just like, just like, Bull, we weren't going for the long answer. I'm sorry to cut you off there, Bull. <laughs> the, the whole point of this was, We've got serious coin invested in these things. And I don't know about most of you, but um, there, there's usually a significant other who uh, is thinking about how much you just spent on your router and oh, how yeah. much you're not or, or are using it to, to recover uh, some of that Correct. funds. Correct. <laughs> A lot of times these funds are coming right out of the household income. In my case, I was using the <clears throat> lunch money for a couple of years to, to, to finance this thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what can we do to pay these things off? This question now, so far I've paid off uh, two router tables, uh, a CNC mill a, and a uh, CNC lathe and a bunch of random tools in the shop on it. But my path may not be the typical path that people take. And so right. we're going to discuss tonight things that you've done that helped you contribute to, to the funds to pay these things off and how fast it, uh, and how, you know, uh, how long it took and, uh, you know, what you could have done differently. Anybody want to start? Well, well I don't mind just for, just to build it, to have it for personal use. I don't sell anything. I just make stuff for friends and family. And same with my my uh, sixty watt home tech. I just use it for, you know, just mm -hmm. to have it. You know, my wife said, Do "You want it? Buy it." So <laughs> that was, you know, that's a good woman keeper. <laughs> right. Do everything you can to be nice. To her. <laughs> so. If I could, sure, go ahead. Just, just, just from another perspective, okay. So we talk about purchasing and investing into these machinery in high hopes of monetary gain, right? Mm -hmm. That's the big dream, right? But I want you to consider what made you even look at this that wasn't monetary gain. There's many reasons to invest a lot of money into the private litter debt, the mega yacht, the $500 million home. It's a thing that we invest in because we have a passion, an interest, a love, or a form of devotion to it if you're doing it for monetary you're you're buying the product to be devoted to it because the only way you're going to make money with it is by using it every day getting in there interacting with it and producing that product but right. let's take a look at one thing my wife thought i was absolutely nuts when i told her i was going to take 80 percent of my life savings and i was going to throw it into myself I have always been a big advocate of betting on myself. Even though I have not made it big time, I'm happy. My wife and me had a few harsh years of trying to justify me hanging on to 15 different CNC machines. And it's a topic that still comes up. Okay, I don't make any product for sale, but I use all of them have paid off 
through educational purposes. I use them for training. So, I me and my wife, the last thing that we talked about that really kind of put this into perspective for both of us was she noticed about my happiness, my level of happiness of, of mulling through to figure out what I'm going to do to make my next dollar with these machines, to getting involved with the community, to try to find out how I can fit into the community, to just making something nice for a neighbor who's sick uh, to lift their spirits. And not to mention the many things that I make just to post up uh, to show people that inspires them. The value is not monetarily there, necessary to be there to justify getting one of these machines. I think we should focus our thought process to how much devotion, once we get one of these machines, will we devote to it to get back our return, whether it's in joy or in monetary value. As John says, he bought a machine, he was retired, he doesn't need to make stuff, but he makes stuff for people. And he is here every week being joyful, happy. And to me, I would have invested $60,000 to feel that joy because he gets into that shop every day, gives him something to do. He goes in there, he gets his mind thinking, he creates something. Please, I ask you all, when you guys are evaluating, I know this is off your topic, Bill, just a little bit, but in a way, it's really not. <laughs> well, well, I'd like to jump in with brother. you, not, not cut anyone <laughs> off, but I would like to jump in. There was a family friend slash customer that came to me this weekend this past weekend and she brought up a really good idea that I hadn't thought of and I probably won't do but if it can help any of you out she said to join in all the groups around your neighborhood the uh the Facebook groups like if they have like a Brook City base this or a you know these groups have thousands of members in them. Anything in your neighborhood, they have thousands of members in them to join into those groups and let them know she's a hairstylist. She says, you will have more work than you can handle yeah. by doing this. And she's a hairstylist, like I said, and this could go for a nail, you know, somebody that does nail, somebody that does CNC, somebody that does engraving. What you know, whatever it is that you may do, um, you know, little wood, uh, little woodworking projects, baby decor, you know, all kinds of stuff to make money. Join into these groups in around you, you know, with so many miles around you, and let them know that you you exist, basically. Yep. Yeah. There. There's uh, meetup.com. Uh, is a, a resource that you can use online that mm -hmm. has uh, listings of places that people meet in your area on specific topics. <laughs> and, you know, that's been around for 10, 15 years, at least. Uh, still a good source uh, of things. Uh, there's your local chamber of commerce. Um, uh, they have meetings, et cetera, where you can find other sources of customers. Because one of the problems that you face when you decide that you want to pay for your machine or to get it to pay pay for something versus just the joy or or you know that it gives us because i get a lot of joy out of my machines let me tell you right but but the but the whole thing is when you when you've got a financial goal to you know be debt free for instance or um to pay something off then you've got to approach it differently and you've got to use the tools that are at your disposal, like the chamber, local chamber of commerce, like local uh, craft fairs, uh, the online world, internet, et cetera. There's a lot of different ways to slice it. Um, so, so go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm, so I think John, John had a good point. Bull had some, had some good points. I think there's two ways 
Um, either you have a machine. In, in my case, um, I'm lucky. I got a great wife. I do pretty much, you know, whatever I want. And um, I finally had to start selling stuff because there was so much stuff around the house. She said, you got to get rid of this stuff somewhere. Yeah. So I started that. That's kind of what got me going. And, and you're right. There's a lot of people around you. But I would say um, as, as, a, uh, as a retired, successful business person, um, if you're going into this and you're going to take some investment money or savings or whatever it is invested in the, in equipment of or machine or whatever it is you're going to do um, and and your goal is to create a revenue stream of whatever kind whether it's your only revenue stream or a partial revenue stream or anything the most important thing to do is to have a plan before you do it yes um, and 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 that kind of goes with any business, but if, if you have a plan, I mean, you can always change the plan, but you really need to sit down and take a look at, okay, I'm going to take this amount of money. I'm going to invest it. And I expect to, to do this with it. Unlike, like John said, and I said, I bought the machine just to have fun and make stuff. Cause I love to make stuff and that's it. So that, I mean, that would be, that would be my advice is if you're going to do it as a, as a revenue stream, make sure you know what you're getting into and make sure you have some sort of a plan before you jump in. Mm -hmm. Even knowing your numbers, the majority of us here didn't know how much we had spent to, to purchase a machine. We were guessing. Right. Um, and if you're doing that as, you know, right from the start as a business, um, then not knowing your numbers is probably the sure, most surefire way to fail. Yeah. And um, since most, many of us, at, I mean, look at the average age of the person in here. Most of us, this is something that is also hobby enjoyment kind of thing. But there are a few of us who are trying to use this as a business that, you know, might pay for your next uh, jet ski or your, you know, your, your kid's tuition or whatever. In that case, you've got to be, you've got to, learn how to get profitable and you got to get, get profitable in a relatively short period of time so that you can pay off these machines so that you can start generating real revenue that you can use for other things. Um, who here, if, if anyone, has already paid off their machines? I'll pay it, Bruno. Oh, yeah, pay. Yeah. Right. I, so, I'd like good, to just expand on my sure, situation because I think it slightly differs um, to you guys or to a few of you here. Um, my angle on it when I started, I didn't really want to get into making money with a CNC. I actually got into it for another reason, and that was to lose money, <laughs> to put it bluntly. <laughs> um, well, that's I, easy to do. <laughs> very easy with CNC. Yeah. Um, the, the, I, I, I've, I've run my own business. I wouldn't say I'm successful, but I do well and I have a lot of fun doing it. I'm an IT person. I consult to a number of companies and I'm also a gun shooter. And uh, one of the things um, I've actually been configuring, I've mentioned it before, but I'll repeat it for people that haven't heard it before. I've actually been connecting and setting up CNCs and doing a thing called statistical process control where I hook up production machines and that to servers and computers for monitoring and things like that. I've always been uh, in the technology uh, sector. I love technology. Like that's just my enjoyment to start with. Um, and as I said, I've been I've been configuring up CNCs for two companies for quite a long time. Never touched one. I can operate a mill. I can operate a lathe, etc. Manually. Um, most of the stuff is fairly simple. What I've needed to do. Um, but what I found was that I I, I encountered a YouTube video or something with um, what people were cutting on the CNCs and the 3D side of it like really fascinated me. Then the next problem that came up was our shooting club and, and shooting in Australia, it's nowhere near as diverse and large as it is in America. Um, we couldn't get trophies and so on. And um, for a few of the guys um, in our club, um, you know, they were making very crude trophies, which were just bits of wood and they put something silly on them, hell, even to using mailing labels for people's names. Um, and I thought, well, let's see what we can do better. And I sort of like looked at the CNC aspect of it and I just made a call um, 
to and I uh, to try that out and I was going to spend some money on it knowing fully well it was going to cost me um, and I went out and uh, purchased a it was actually a secondhand 6040 machine one thing I love about people is people go out and buy expensive things and they find out it's too hard for them or it just they can't do it and then they just throw it away and sell it for next to nothing um, I've picked up three CNC machines for sub four hundred dollars um, and I've picked up a Gravograph, an old Gravograph that I've upgraded for $200. And the, the figure that I threw out was basically the stuff that I've purchased from China as far as stepper motors and so on. Uh, and then I've built and all the aluminium and everything I've um, collected from scrap metal yards. Uh, we have a couple of good scrap metal yards where um people throw away perfectly good materials still with their plastic coatings on them and so on um sheets of aluminium and so on um everyone's turning to this minimalist um thing where once they finish the job they're doing if there's a full sheet of 10 mil 12 by 24 um aluminium they'll scrap it and wait for the next job they won't store it um, so that's how I ended up building that stuff up. But there is one thing, and this also reflects as to how I got into computers. And um, once I get, once I, I, I get it to learn um, as a hobby, but instead of actually making stuff and selling it, and this is the, you may have heard me comment, I don't know how you make money off those bottle openers or wooden spoons or whatever, the amount of time it takes, there's so much other stuff that you can make so much more money on. Um, yeah. is that um, through, I started in CNC in 2019 and by 20, uh, tw by the end of 21, I'd learned so much about CNC. I'm now being contracted by other companies to do 3D design and program their CNCs for them. So the other aspect of actually where you make your money from learning technology and the skills uh, with programming it and using it is that you can actually better your employment um, and work for somebody else. Um, I'm still investigating doing some of the market scene and stuff like that because I think that'd be just fun. I don't care if I make money or not, but it'd just be fun because I go to a lot of those um, trade shows and so on anyway. It'd be nice to sit behind one of those benches and just talk to people and sell some stuff, etc. But the, the, the bigger part of actually making money is or the, the value in it is the education that you actually gain as well as the enjoyment in what you are doing. And, and that, that's been my view on it as well. But um, one of the items where I found where you actually do make very good money is to approach some other uh, businesses, particularly engineering shops, um, woodworking places, and um, one of the things that I program for one of the companies is chair legs, like just little, wow. about 140 millimetres long, down to 60 millimetres long, you know, the legs that you see underneath the lounge chairs and stuff like that. Program that on or CNC lay for them. Um, uh, I've done a bit of overflow work for an engineering shop and I still yeah. do it. And we're talking $300 an hour, by the way, guys. We're not talking about like little peanuts where you've got to go sell. And this is all pre-contracted stuff. And that's just cutting um, polyurethane or polyethylene or ultra high density polyethylene um, rings, seals, gaskets, et cetera. And you don't need a big CNC for it. Um, but you really, it depends on what you're interested in. Um, go and approach a local furniture shop or uh, engineering shop and say hey guys what have you got in plastic aluminium or brass that you need machine that's a pain for you thank you that is awesome um you know just doing some quick math here based on what you just said ned uh at 300 dollars an hour you only need to work for 13 hours to pay off the machine that you said you paid four grand for and that's the name you're you're muted by the way and that's the name yeah, i muted speaker. myself because my wife's talking next to me yeah. over there yeah no look as i said i think people that force themselves to go in there and they go i can make money off this um as mike said you better have a plan be prepared to adjust that plan when you find that that's not where you're making money from but with a bit of patience and time and i think it comes back down to what bebe said um is join a groups and get other people get 
other people ordering stuff off you or something like that. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, you, you, you got to know what you're doing before you can actually apply a service, particularly with CNC. If you don't know nothing about wood, you're not going to cut stuff for uh, cut stuff out of wood for people. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. There's there's a uh, um, a lot to to pull out of that um, statement. Um, a lot of people are marketing from business to consumer at the the county fairs and the, the trade shows and everything, but you can all you can also market from business to business. And in fact, um, outside of my own products, which I make and sell, the B two B has been one really good source of, of income for me doing projects for other businesses that are already um, up and running because they have money to spend on, on these things and they have a specific need and their projects are generally short term. Um, uh, I don't, short term is probably not the term I'm looking for, uh, but they're, they're short cycle times. Uh, for instance, I did some work for a cabinet shop that was doing um, a special kind of pull-out drawer uh, for inside of these cabinets. And they had a, a range of parts they needed made, you know, and prototypes. And in their situation, they couldn't slow down their production machine to do the prototyping. And so what they did was they contacted me. I did, I took their, their drawings, did up the CAD work and did up the, uh, the uh, cam files to get, you know, my cutting pass and tool pass and everything, and then ran the first samples of that, put them all in a box, shipped them to them, get a yay or nay on the approval. They asked me to change a few things, you know, went through the cycle and I was paid very well to do this. And in fact, that one cabinet job would have been in more than enough to pay off my machine in its entirety. So, um, you know, there's lots of ways to skin this cat. Um, uh, guys, anything? Um, I, I got a different approach to this because I am a, a, a build and sale. And I don't treat my CNC router any different than my, my drill press or my table saw. And it was purchased because I had made a burial box from my mother years and years ago and to the bequest of my three brothers. People saw it, started asking me to make more burial boxes, also to help the community that couldn't afford burials. So I invested slash purchased the CNC in a machine to speed up the ever de growing demand for these burial boxes. Now we're 85% in the Midwest here in the United States. Um, people are you know, buried in ashes. So to speed that up, I bought the CNC to carve the tops and it paid for itself. Um, you know, a, 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 an inexpensive burial box guys goes for 350 bucks uh, as high as 4,000. So needless to say, I paid off my $5,000 machine within a heartbeat uh, to the joy of my wife. And then uh, I actually had to hire some people in. Um, this shop that I run, is a secondary shop. Um, I work for a company with three large letters in it, and it's blue, and that's my main my main income. So I started this out uh, with the research then of the demand before I jumped into it. Um, hire a bunch of high schoolers and Botechers that are inexpensive, and then it, it grew into a, a full blown business. So that's that's kind of my history. Um, I'm still working off of one machine. I'm building another machine, so I can do uh, architectural turning. I do that on the side bill, and guys mm -hmm. for uh, churches in town here in the, in the surrounding area. I started out at I wouldn't do anything beyond 50 miles. Now I'm shipping stuff all over the place, architectural turning on the fourth axis. So the next machine I'm building is going to be on a you know, four and a half axis machine. Mm -hmm. So it's it's all based Thank you on for sharing of, that with us. I know that was very sentimental and and uh, I mean something really great has come out of all of it. So amen to that. Yeah, thank and, you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So I've, go ahead. Oh, sorry, keep, sorry, no, no, you keep talking, Mark. I'll I can just wait till you finish. 
Oh, <laughs> so uh, I guess, uh, you know, from the lessons learned, um, it was purchased as a just another tool um, with the clear need to expand what was going on. Um, I had done research in the area of, uh, is this something that's needed? Um, cutting, cutting boards and you're competing with everyone else that's making cutting boards is not a, I don't see as a very good business model. And then uh, know how to uh, get it out sitting behind a table in these uh, various places and communicating people and selling your wares is, is a is a good thing if you're retired but as a businessman uh, there's no way I could survive just driving to these places um, here in the Midwest to let alone make any money you know 100 to 300 dollars so look at your model carefully and, and what you want to do with it um, and, and what you invest in um, not poo-pooing cutting boards a lot of people really enjoy making it but as a businessman, um, that is not a, a marketable thing. And I think Ned had said that before, or Bull did. Um, but th that's just a little bit of my 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 business background <laughs> speaking. There is, uh, I, I, you know, I put my girls through college with by paying cash out of my business. It's it's, it's unheard of kind of thing. So it's uh, also plan on spending eighteen hours a day in your shop. This is not something nine to five. No way. It's blood, sweat, and tears, heads down. And you got to deal with all types of people. All types. Um, well, I don't think any successful business, if you're the owner, is a nine to five. There's no such no. thing as that. There's no way. There no, was hey. a customer that just came to me today, and mm. they make Hawaiian urns. Um, I forgot the actual name of it. I'd have to ask my daughter, but um, it, this one was, let me actually show it to you. Um, it was made out of, it looks like a boat and they wanted the, the boat's name engraved in it. And then of course the, the writing on top of it, that's what they came to me for uh, to get it engraved. It is beautiful. So they, they make whatever the customer asks, like if it's a Hawaiian instrument or whatever it may be, it opens at top. I'm sorry, I'm trying to be very careful with it and turn on my camera here at the same time. Let me see, how do I turn my camera around again, you guys? There's a little um, yeah. thing with two arrows. It's in a circle. Uh, that, uh, gotcha, okay. Perfect. So this is it right here, and it opens up at top. It's a special kind of wood. Uh, asked him where he got the wood from. He said a tree in the back of their, their house. It's got some felt in the inside. So this one's out a, a boat. Beautiful, just beautiful. $1,200 right here. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so they said that, uh, like a lot of things, you know, when you're putting your, your time into it, a lot of people don't want to pay. And so he's mainly works out of word of mouth. And I told him, I said, get on Etsy as if there's, you know, a lot of people that, that, um, there's a lot of people that would love to ah, I'm sorry I'm trying to get out of here <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of people that would love to uh you know just uh in that market you know for for um the last one he can't even pronounce it it was an instrument a ukulele something like that mm -hmm. That's and, right. uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, and so, so this um, Hawaiian urn. Hawaiian something, urns. They they put the ashes in there and then set them out to sea. Is that it? Uh, you know what? I don't know what they do after they put the ashes in there, but it's it's I suppose it's something sentimental to them that they asked this gentleman to make. Mm. And he's I mean, he makes it out of wood, metal. This one's made out of a very thin wood. Um, looks beautiful though, the, the colors on it and such. Um, 
excuse me, wood, metal, um, leather, uh, just different materials that he makes these out of. Uh, I'm guessing he hand makes them. He was asking me a lot of questions and I asked him a few questions and such, but yeah, it seems very much like he has a, a really good uh, thing going there. Oh, step and, on those uh, scissors. I was... <laughs> uh, 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 memorial bench, so I'm doing the the vinyl for it. Uh, let me see here. I, I'm so sorry. I, I'm on this camera. There we go. Okay, y'all continue. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> You'll get it figured out. There we go. There, there go. we go. Yeah, and I would like, I've never heard of a burial box. I've heard of coffins and I've never heard of a burial box. Thank you, Mark. I just looked it up and it uh, looks like a very in interesting thing. And um yeah, they, they look quite attractive. Um, it was a similar thing that I had pop up. I've sort of put a picture in the background, save, sharing it, so on. Mm -hmm. um, I've only done one of those, but that was just a little plaque on a 150 by 200 or something like that, a headstone for a pet. And, um, and you know, it's something as simple as that is another thing that I haven't heard or seen a lot of competition for. It's, it's a very local right, thing, right. Ned. And um, yeah, I do pets as well. Um, here in, in this area, they take a paw print in a, in a polycast and it's, it's a random thing. So I, I will cut into the top of the box. Uh, so the, the poly print and then the name or whatever font and stuff they want into the top as well. Um, I had one lady uh, who buried, wanted to bury her husband in the, uh, the rock garden. So um, she had me put divots in and she glued she glued uh, herself the rocks her favorite rocks that they uh, when they had met into the top of the box and then he was put into some some form or something in a in a in a, in a storage area so there's there's all of this custom stuff and that just drives the the cost up don't be afraid to, to charge for it um, right and then also follow the rules and regulations of your area um, i'm not allowed to put brass and stainless steel into my burial boxes if they're going into the ground and there's no crypt over them because as they rot they come to the surface and then a lawnmower hits them mm. so ah. that's, a, that's always an interesting thing to how do you figure out how to do that and you're laughing but uh you know there's there's all of these restrictions and you, you know people I, I was more so wondering who, who the hell comes up with these rules uh, people I understand <laughs> the guy who owns the lawnmower and had to replace the blade. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, I, so, so much stuff gets buried into the ground, and they're going to talk about a few hinges or, or it, anyway. It, yeah, it, sorry, it, yeah. And then the ashes guys come in a plastic box, and it's a very specific size in the United States, and it comes in a plastic box. Inside of that is a plastic bag. They do not allow me to place the box inside of the burial box. Because if it gets mixed up, like who's going to know, the ashes that were buried by name would be different than the ashes buried by a different name. So I have to transport or mail or whatever these boxes to the to the place that they're doing the ashes or at the church. And then they place it in, drive the screws in, can't be brass, and then they turn it over to the family. It's, it's, uh, it's I never would have guessed this unless I'd gotten into it. But yeah, and That's then you go amazing. to California, you go to California and they throw them off a lover's leap, the ashes or out of airplanes. So you got extremes. Are you, are you allowed to use um, some of the phenol based blues and stuff like that? Or is there a restriction on that as well? Jeez. Don't don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did a pewter cross for one that went to South Dakota. And they they had to take the cross off after the ceremony. Oh That's wow! There, there's a a related um, opportunity here as well. Uh, memorial plaques um, mm -hmm. in in uh, in relief carving. So, for instance, if I took a, a picture of you know a portrait of of someone, um, 
I'm going to talk about a specific software, but you could do this in lots of different ones. Um, so like in, in, in Aspire, you can create the basic outlines of the shapes, do a very light sculpting so that it looks kind of like a Play-Doh thing where you're pushing in where the eyes are, and you know, pulling back where the mouth is, but no detail. And then you can generate from the from the picture a um, a skin, if you will, or a bitmap that or that that goes over the top surface features, I believe it's called. And you can place that over it, and now it gives that image the depth that it lacked is if you tried to um, sculpt every little detail. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I use I use yeah. SketchUp, and that's called soap skinning. And yeah. Uh, that's awesome, Bill. Yeah, and yeah. you clean up the noise, and then you do it. We did one for um, a librarian who passed. Um, they they made a memorial room in the library for them. And it's it's uh, kind of what we did. Um, Just out of curious, curiosity, has anybody in here made something that was out of sheer joy that that became extremely profitable? Sure, sure. What would you make, Bill? <laughs> it was joyful for me triple edge finders <laughs> and we're and guess what we've got a winner from the community <laughs> challenge so i'm going to be sending you an address for sure. our winner and you'll milk uh, and i'll send one out, the, yeah. no one out. <laughs> I, we appreciate that but, but even even more so something that gave me joy the desk i'm not going to show it <laughs> it is like covered right now but <laughs> But the <laughs> desk that I'm sitting at, it's actually two desks. Um, when I first got the router, there was a company that was making these desks that um, slotted together, no hardware. And they were beautiful. And they made them out of bamboo and uh, all kinds of other sustainable woods and everything. You know, it was really uh, quite pricey. And uh, I sat down with a CAD and I grew up my own desk and then um they had a smaller table for a printer you know a big laser printer but that wasn't big enough so i created my own shape using that same thing so that project was one of the first things i ever put on youtube um after i had completed it and this gives me i mean it's been what 10 15 years uh, something like that um and this thing it gives me joy when it because I made it and I was not a woodworker at the time. You know, I made that on my machine. It gives me a lot of joy. And I had people ask if I would sell them. And I didn't feel right about doing that because it was based off of someone else's design. Uh, but yeah, gave me a lot of joy. Good. Uh, I I know that when before I transitioned to figure out what my product was, when I started my journey five years ago as a home base business, because I had the CNC, I had the skills. What the hell was I going to do? Mm -hmm. I did what all of us did, right? We started looking at markets and then we go, where do we fit in? So we start looking at these markets. And for me, my market was barbecue. Why? Because I'm in Texas and it's barbecue season 24 seven here. Not to mention there was pro levels of barbecuing where people invested just like any other hobby. And sure enough, I sold cutting boards from anywhere between $80 to $600 mm -hmm. for cutting boards. And it was a great little thing, but I really got kind of tired of making cutting boards my first year. So what I started doing is while I was waiting for glue ups or whatever, I started tinkering with a, uh, the fad was the squirrel bench feeder. Remember that? The picnic table and you put the little nuts on yep. there. Everybody and their brother was making them. I decided to do my take, uh, take on it and I called it the squirrel saloon. I made a little bar, turn out some little tiny bottles, put up some little stools, make a little saloon thing. I had so much happiness with that. When I posted that up 
to my surprise, I was at one point when I first brought it out, selling more of those, but making just as much as I would pushing my cutting board, which goes kind of cycles back to the beginning of this topic, which is regardless of what your objective is, monetary or pleasure, the best advice is put it in something that you're going to be devoted to making that you enjoy making because without it you're just making another product and trust me it's like michael and mark both already said you're not going to do 40 hours in your home based business you're going to wind up doing 80 hours 110 hours it's on your mind it's 24 7 if it's going to be on your mind that much let's make it a happy thought that's on our mind problems that we want to solve problems that we want to overcome that's the reason why we are so committed and dedicated when we first buy our cnc to learn how to operate that and there is nothing more valuable in my personal opinion to gain that experience from purchasing whatever cnc machine that you choose to do or whatever home-based business you wish to start up so I, we have go, go ahead i was i was gonna uh see if milo had any comment and then we get to ned you know i gotta i've gotta agree with what bull said you know you you need to enjoy what you're doing because you know, in, in order to be motivated, you need to be inspired. And you can get motivation and you can have it for a while, but if you're not inspired, you won't keep that motivation. Motivation will eventually die. There's got to be inspiration along with that motivation. So what Bull said, you know, the short answer, I, good stuff, Bull. But, you know, it, that, that's really what you, what, to me, what it takes. And it, and it doesn't matter what you're doing. I don't care if it's CNC machine what business it is, you've got to be inspired. And, and you look at people that are successful, most of them were inspired by, by what they're doing, you know, and, and that, that created their motivation. So, you know, that stuff's really important. And uh, the topics that Mark brought up, having a business plan, you know, is really important. Um, you know, I started out, you know, thinking, well, you know, $5,000 and I can, make stuff with my CNC, you know, and start a, start a side hustle. And, you know, $20,000 later, um, I actually had what I needed, you know? <laughs> so, so, you know, you need to, you need to kind of take that into consideration when you're starting out, do your research, you know what I mean? Because yeah, I just, you know, I didn't realize I was going to have, you know, uh, you know, thousands of dollars of software, thousands of dollars worth of bits, you know, table saws, uh, joiners, planers, all the hand tools and stuff that go with it, uh, decent uh, dust collection, air compressor system, lighting, uh, benches, uh, all the sanding equipment, um, routers, router tables, you know, everything that goes along with it, you know, it just, it adds up. So yeah, good business plan. And then know what you're, know what, what you're, uh, know what you're getting into and, um, and get yourself out there. If you're an introvert, it's going to be tough for you to make it in any business. You know, you're, you're selling yourself at this stuff, folks. And if you're an introvert, man, it's going to be really tough. If, if you if you like people and you you like like talking with people, you can tell your story. You'll make it. Yeah. Happy thoughts, folks. You got it, Martin. Mindset. Yeah. Has anybody here read um, "Think and Grow Rich"? Yeah, actually, I've read it a couple of times. Yeah, me too. <laughs> That's a good old book. <laughs> I was selling I was selling the MP3 version of that on Amazon a few few years back in in Kindle for a for a dollar a pop. I don't know where I downloaded it, and uh, I was selling it for the the audio version for a dollar a pop on Amazon. I made about six hundred and fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. that, that was my my short lived Kindle business. Yeah, well, it it used to be in the public domain. Somebody just bought it up, um, bought up the rights to the book again. Now they recopyrighted it, so you can't do that anymore. But, but the reason I brought that up, it's a book that talks about your mindset 
It talks about how you think about what it is that you're doing. Yeah. And, you know, the, the level of focus that you have to have in order to go forward and do things as a business. Now, a lot of us are here aren't doing this for business. We're doing it for pleasure. But a lot of us are um, doing it for business. And, and that book is probably one of the best um, examples of, of practical, although slightly dated, uh, knowledge on, on you know, what goes in and why a, a businessman thinks differently than um, you know, the average guy off the street. So highly recommended if you get a chance to check yeah, that out. It's good. That's it's good stuff, Bill. You know, and there's a lot of there's some newer guys that are out there that basically teach the same thing uh as as Napoleon Hill did and and um uh, you know your Zig Ziglers and guys like that really a similar teaching. Um, yeah. you know Anthony Anthony Robbins, you know a lot of his stuff is just you know you you could you can Watch Anthony Robinson and go into Think and Grow Rich, and you'll find it in there somewhere. You know. Yep. So it's just same yeah. same principle. Yeah, I I think most of the things that are in these uh, books were developed thousands of years ago, and they've just been handed down and then compiled and put out in the books, and people you know helps people to to get a shortcut to get the information. But uh, but that was the whole point. Um, one thing that is in not only that book, but several other books irrelevant where the source comes from is how to approach this when, let's say that we bought a, um, an Avid CD for 10 grand or whatever it is. I think they're 15 now, but let's just say 10 grand because we can work with that number because it's e easy uh, to divide by. And you have a lot of other things that you have to go, but you've got 10 grand into the package and you, you have enough equipment and everything to go forth and do your business. Okay. If you want to pay that off, how many things do you have to sell at what price point do you have to sell them at that will equal the 10 grand and plus your interest or whatever and your overhead and everything. But let's, let's just focus on the one thing, the, the, the cost of that machine. There's a lot of ways to make 10 grand. You could sell a $10 product to a thousand people. And that's 10 grand. Probably not easy to make a profit doing that. You could sell, you could sell um, a hundred dollar product to, um, uh, you want to make uh, here, hundred people? Yep, 10 grand. <laughs> you could sell one product to one guy for 10 grand and it makes that 10 grand. So you can work the problem backwards and you, you figure out whether you wanna sell a low ticket item, a mid ticket item or a high priced item and and you know work that math. And at least you know going in approximately what you gotta do. I like um, uh, selling low ticket items because people don't think about it as often. They, they just buy. And you, they don't really scrutinize the low value purchases as much as they do a big one. So mm -hmm. you, I think you make more money making small items. I, I tend to agree yeah. with you on that weight, but only if you buy those small items from China or something like that, where it doesn't cost you anything. One of the one of my biggest criticisms is people that spend twenty minutes making a bottle opener and then selling it for five or ten dollars. It's um, yeah, yeah. yeah. My wife yeah. and I, we had a small scroll saw business and uh, I would scroll saw and she would paint it and uh, she was working on a minimum wage job that she hated and she was getting picked on. And I said, you don't have to be picked on. We do woodworking and painting. And eventually we grew this into a business. I, I went out and sold it to uh, about 15 stores and that's that's her income now. So. There, There's a... There's a guy who writes uh, writes a, a book and has a podcast, Ryan Daniel Moran. Uh, and his book, I think it's called The Road to a Million or, so, or, or something like that. He takes a million dollar idea and his market is Amazon. Okay, that's where he wants to, to, to put his product out. And what he does is he comes up with one product that he sells for $30 that sells 25 um, a day. Multiply that out, uh, and 
you know, you, you get a specific amount, 25 times 30, all right? Once he has that product selling at that rate, then he launches another product and then another and another until he has four products that are selling for 30 bucks each, 25 a day. So in total, he's selling 100 products a day at 30 bucks. That's a million dollar business because he worked the numbers backwards. So, you know, maybe you're, your, maybe your goal is not to make a million dollars. Maybe it's just to make, you know, um, 40 grand or whatever a year to replace uh, the, the income from something else or to, you know, put towards your kid's college fund or whatever. Whatever that number is, you can work it backwards and then come up with a plan. I, think I got started and, you know, I've thrown a lot of stuff at the wall. Um, waste a lot of money on materials and, you know, just trying different things. And, you know, eventually I want to get to where Ned was talking about earlier. I think it was Ned talking about earlier where he was making some gasket material or, you know, some manufacturing is where I really want to be, you know, an industrial CNC or a couple of them, you know, and, and manufacturing something. And I, this was, this is kind of, I'm at still at the, in the kind of the stepping point of this whole thing. And is, is learning and, and figuring out what's going to work. And, you know, it, you really need to, if you want to be that sign guy, then, then, then you need to figure out how you're going to be the, the guy that's got 50,000 sales on Etsy or Amazon or eBay or, or whatever, or your own website, Shopify, other things like that, you know, and, um, you know, I, the, the high ticket items, I have some items I have. I just did a sign for a guy and it was $1,500 and it was an 18 by 36 inch sign. So that's a good price for that size of a sign, but that's a, you know, a billionaire that those, those, those are few and far between unless you can find that niche. You know, if you can find that niche and, and get into that, man, that's great. But yeah, the low ticket items, you've got to sell a ton of stuff and it, it just becomes a, it becomes a, a big chore when you need to sell just a, a bunch of small things, you know, the profit margins are good, but the, 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 the price points are so low that really, even with a great margin, you, you, you know, it's, it's tough. So, you know, it's, uh, that's one of the things I've struggled with. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out that one product or two products that I can manufacture and get into that realm of it. And rather than, Rather than doing the retail end, I think the business to business market is is just I think it's I think it's better. You know, you can find that find a couple of contracts like that and do do pretty well. Well, it, it's it's not just a case of finding contracts. And I'll just take a step back. I think the um, uh, I think the important thing is, and um, uh, Marsh is actually typing some stuff. What I hate about low prices. Uh, what I hate about low ticket stuff is that you have to drag it around with you. Yes, um, there, there's a lot of problems with doing the market scene, but I think the important thing is, is that you need to identify who you can deal with. Are you a people person? And I'm not a people person. I can't talk to the end customer. If I was in Mark's business, I would definitely not survive. I have very minimal empathy and so on. And um and with the, um, even with the headstone uh, for the pets, I've said to my wife, talk to people. If I say to them, to me, it's just a animal that has died. Um, <laughs> but to women and other people, it's, it, it's a lot more. I'm saying that we, we, we've got a dog and I love our dog and so on, but it's still to me, it's an animal. So, but if I'm talking to other business people, um, I understand what their priorities are uh, and I feel that I can deliver, you know, I, I can identify timelines and so on and, uh, and deliver. And then you've got the other aspects, as Marsh was saying, like, you know, you've got to load your van up and cart all that woodworking stuff and so on. And you've got to have a passion for that in order to do that. And one day I will enjoy that, but it'll be when I retire. It's not something I want to do today. Um, and going to a B2B, and look, today it might be engraving numbers onto little discs, and they might only want 10,000 of them or 100,000 of them, and they might want them by the end of the week. But 
um, there's your work as long as you can handle the repeatability. And when that's finished, they'll have another project where they'll have something else they need made or whatever. And if you find three or four businesses in your area that you can handle some of their overflow work, to me, that's a lot more appealing to go and pick it up, do it for a little bit of less money or whatever, but that I know that I have a quantity and then I operate three or four machines. Now, do you have a Kia or a Kia Lake? Uh, yeah, we got a Kia here. Yeah. Yeah. There's a everything in the Midwest here for a Kia is made in the Midwest. And the guys in my club are, are finding uh, huge niches in that area. Like you said, 10,000 or something with an engraved. You know, they make 10,000 doors for that for those 3000 beds or whatever that that seems to be really lucrative uh, mm -hmm. area if you can get your foot in the door but you work your ass off because now you're moving materials that weigh tons you gotta you know <laughs> your b2b comment i just it flagged me and i was like yeah if you really want to get into it you better buy a truck you know mm -hmm. well well, my experience with B to B, I've taken it out now. It's it's about an A, like the biggest one that I've done is an A four size, a, roughly A four size mm -hmm. piece of um, uh, HDPE ultra ultra high density polyethylene, uh, twelve mil thick, and it was basically a seal. You get two halves to seal for a gate valve. That's been the biggest part, and there's been some smaller brackets and brass bits and pieces, um, and everything you can pick up in your car they supply the materials so on but yeah that, that is another aspect of it if you are planning big on that yeah you'll need forklifts and trucks and god knows what material handling to get it on with the cnc's particularly if you want to get those numbers out yeah there's there's a fellow down in in arkansas who is making parts for a 3d printer a company a company that makes 3d printers and he's making them at the same price point or better than China is at the moment, but that's all he does 24 seven. He's got his machines and he has them going, uh, yes. you know, going these, and going. Are these plastic parts or what are they? They're, they're aluminum parts and he's making them out of um, a combination of a router and a mill. So, yeah, it's just, he found somebody who was, getting those parts made over in China and said, I can make them here in the US. I can, and he found ways to match the point by getting the volume to the right play, you know, doing doing his homework and getting his, his materials and things. But it, he really didn't, in my opinion, build a business as much as he built a job. Yeah. Because he has mm -hmm. to be there to make this happen. And, um, there's nothing wrong with jobs. I, I've, I've had jobs. We probably all have. Um, but um, owning a business and, and having a job are different. And they serve two, two different. Um, they're, they're just different. And no, no, that's uh, actually that's actually a very good point you made there. It's um, yeah, if you have to sit there and work yourself, then yeah. Um, but there is another aspect to it. If you can implement auto automation, so yeah. is that you only have to oversee it and you don't have to oversee people, mm -hmm. that then becomes a business. But if you have to sit there and grind for that money, then no. Yeah. When I when I first started making the, the edge finders, I was making them one at a time in a vice. You know, one. I remember that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> one at a time in a vice. And it just was was you, killing me you posted bill you posted bill what am i going to do i have 12 to make this weekend and it was snowing to beat the band i'll never yep. forget that and i'm going he fell into the trap yep <laughs> yep and then thankfully uh i had a solution <laughs> you discovered pallets palletizing yes yep <laughs> when when uh when i got the right equipment that i could have multiple parts loaded up ready to go put them on the machine hit cycle start let it go while i'm doing something else in the shop so i'm not just babysitting that one part at a time now the the downside is if you get it wrong you can ruin 
<laughs> an entire pallet of parts. Um, hopefully it doesn't go that long. But the point is being able to, you know, in, in, in this case, it was going up six to one. You know, when I, when I push the button, I get six parts out now versus having to push the button multiple times to get one part out. And, you know, then adding the, you know, the, the automatic tool changer. And, you know, uh, there, there was just ways that you can, you can do this, but you, you got to get smart about it. If you're going to do the same part over and over again, then you, you should figure out ways to do as many of them as you can in, in one shot. Um, you're actually using the machine for what it was designed yeah mm -hmm. yeah so, and I, I, kick, I kick myself for being that silly <laughs> at the beginning but you know well, you, you, you spent two weeks just trying to get the fluid to work i mean yeah i was watching this whole thing unfold i'm going oh my god you you, you struggle just to get the machine off the flipping pallet to the floor and get it oh hooked my up gosh and yeah it was it a was lot terrible. of work yep <laughs> <laughs> so, so if i were buying a new machine uh, we're off topic again guys this, this has been tonight if i were buying a milling machine again in in roughly the same price point you know neighborhood uh, i would probably buy one that came pre-assembled instead of having to put it together like i did with with the tormach now tormachs come pre-assembled now for a little extra so you, you can do that but having the the truck arrive them drop the uh, the pallet down to the ground and you wheeling it into the to the spot and then choking up your electricity and air and, and everything being able to hit the button so much better than spending two weeks uh getting it was longer than two weeks actually uh, you spent you spent two weeks getting the coolant working yes yeah <laughs> And the coolant on the stock machine really was terrible. I yeah. ended I ended up, and I'm about to go back on topic after this. But, but <laughs> sorry, but I ended up getting my own sump pump, creating my own bin, yeah. running all the the hoses and everything to get enough volume out of the coolant system so that I could run flood coolant um, because the little box that came with it held like two and a half gallons in it what you went through it like that yeah so yeah there was a lot of experience with this machine but it was, it was worth it i learned a lot yeah back on um, topic <laughs> back on topic paying for the machine um thankfully this sucker paid for itself now there i don't sell as many today as i did when this all started because there's a million people out there who are making similar products now? Yeah. Just the way it is. I didn't patent it or, or anything when it when it got started, but um, I don't care. I can come up with another another product that I can sell, and I'll do it smarter this time. Um, or I can take on different work, or I could just sit back and enjoy it. My machine's paid for. But that's the whole point. That's the thing I want you to be able to get to to the to the point where you're not worried about a monthly payment or you're you're not you know trying to pay off that credit card debt that you just put yourself in when you bought the machine there's ways to do this well there's... see the other oh sorry yeah i thought you finished yeah so another another aspect to what you said there um i i can't do repetitive work um i I've, I've got to be thinking I can do repetitive work for a short period of time, short runs, et cetera, but I need something challenging and so on all the time. So that sort of um, fails me. Otherwise I'd be a millionaire now with all the automation that I can set up and stuff like that. But I just can't sit there watching the same thing. It becomes boring. Um, but um, um, where was I heading this yet? So, so basically, yeah, I think people also need to look at is whether they can do that same part repetitiveness because people have become billionaires off selling toothpicks and matches. Um, but is that what you want to do for the rest of your life? Um, and sort of like to take a step back, the picture that I have in my background, that was one of the first amongst some of the first things that I designed um, because I do have this passion for military, World War One, World War Two, et cetera, particularly. 
and um, my target is to actually make um, memorials. At the moment, I don't see that as a profitable thing, but I'm only doing it because I enjoy it. But where my target is, uh, hang on, pick the wrong one. I've just changed the picture again. Uh, choose my virtual background. Um, yeah, so basically uh, where my target is, is to do memorials and so on. And uh, did that come up? No. Uh, Your camera is off. The moment. How did I turn it off? Oh, I just click that button there. Yeah, there we go. So, um, oh shit, you don't see it, but at the top there is a little AIF logo. That's actually a very boring one, that one there. But um, I guess you guys call them shadow boxes um, or something to that effect. Um, but my target is to make them a lot more decorative, um, more in that Victorian period. You can't see it on that, but it's got like little arches up the top and so on, and the swirls and little and some have got pillars and stuff like that so what but see what my material what material is that done out of now um wood the same as a uh, uh, same as a shadow box but a little bit more fancier you guys tend to put the flag in there and some of the metals same same deal do the medals uh, put in any of the awards but have some uh, but you also have some 3d um etc um, um badges and logos and stuff like that i've already started reproducing badges from the rats to brook and things like that um but the thing is my plan is that is a few years few more years down the track but i will i will not be selling them for five dollars a piece or something my target will be anywhere from two thousand dollars plus um the the timber is expensive the time to do the carvings and if people do want it i'll do it but i'm not going they'll, they'll be on a contract thing and it'll be yeah. um yeah. as when i when i'm sort of like in that semi-retirement it'll be a premium price for people that want that extra and yeah. i will not be selling it short yeah. um, and i've had people yeah. asking me to sell them that aif logo that i've designed um but I didn't want to flood the market with my designs because that's something that I'll be using down the track myself. So that was sort of like my plan in the future. At the moment, I'm doing short run repeat orders, like not really a fan of it, but it does make money. Um, and as I said, where I make my money at the moment is um, in, in the premium suburbs or in the, in the higher end suburbs. Um, particularly with woodwork, my phone is buried somewhere. I can hear it, but I can't see it. Oh, it's in my pocket, that's why. Um, yeah, so I'll just I'll call them back. Yeah, yeah so um, um, is I'm actually doing a lot of this 3D design work and I'm actually getting contracted for it. But as Bill said earlier, it's more of a job rather than a business at the moment. Yeah, you, you, half the problem is recognizing that. Uh, you know, I have no problem with somebody doing job work to raise uh, a stream of income for short term to get out from under something. You know, I, I think that's probably the, the coolest thing. I do it myself. Um, I'll take on work when I have a particular need or, or a particular goal or something that I want to achieve right now. Um, and, but I'm picking and choosing the job and I'm picking and choosing the kind of work that I want to do. And I know going in how long that work will last because if, um, I've had people say, well, they'd like you to do, um, work as a, as a CNC programmer, um, nine to five, um, five days a week and uh, possible, uh, you know, weekends and, and, and holidays. And I say, I'm not your guy. Yeah. Another thing, too, guy. some of the, you know, I think uh, Myron was talking about it. And, you know, you talk about manufacturing and, and you really have, in my mind, two separate things with manufacturing. Either you're contract manufacturing, which means you're making pieces or parts for somebody else, or you've developed your own product and you're manufacturing that mm -hmm. and selling it. Um and I think, you know, that's, that's the end that I came from. I was lucky enough to um, figure out something and got a couple of patents and, and, and that, but 
that didn't, I mean, that it mattered, but, you know, I started building these things myself by hand then realizing that all of a sudden I couldn't do that and I couldn't buy enough equipment to make it. And everybody told me, oh, you're going to have to have it made in China. And I said, no, I'll never make it in China. And I didn't. I was able to have the stuff made in the United States and sold in the United States and was very successful at it. But my point being is if you are, uh, if you're contract manufacturing, you're always looking for that next job. If you're manufacturing your own product, you also have to be manufacturing that product, but you have to be developing the next product. What's going to be, what's your next thing? Because nothing is in perpetuity. No. You know? So, um, and that's, uh, that's a, something that I still help other people with. If they have an idea, I'll help them, you know, try to develop that and get it to manufacturing. And I don't even, I, I'm not making any money at that. I don't want to, but if I have somebody comes to me and says, Hey, I got this product and I want to do it. I'll kind of try to head them down the right road. But anyway, it, my point being, there's two different two different types of manufacturing: contract manufacturing, which is just a job, or you're you're developed a product that you can go out and sell, which is obviously going to be more profitable. But you still got to worry about the next one. I, I think the same problem is there even with manufacturing. When you when you manufacture you still um, have to find a market. So whether you're, whether you're advertising to the end customer or whether you're advertising to a, um, to a partner that's then going to on sell for you um, or whether your product is for other manufacturers that they use, um, I, I, I sort of see the same thing because either can be long-term or short-term. And there's always got to be a, a like a backup in case that ends. Yeah, I would. I, I see what you're saying. I would, in 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 some degree, disagree with that, though. If if you don't have a development, then you don't have a future. Right. Exactly. That's exactly it, Mark. You've got to, You've got to have the next product. Um, but if you've got a good product and you've got a good uh, you have uh, good sales channels, um, and and if you're in manufacturing of, of especially a mass marketing product, you want to have several different sales channels. You don't want to leave it all at once. And you're exactly right, Mark. You've got to have. But then, if you are are able to do that, then that leaves you as the product developer or inventor mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call yourself the ability to go in and have fun because you can come up with the next product. And you can play with it and prototype it and yeah. uh, break it and smash it and do whatever you want with it until it comes until you figure out it's going to be saleable. What do you find that do you, do you find that you're a little bit more vulnerable in that situation, Mike? As far as well, you know, as, as opposed to doing the contract type work, you know, I would think that would be I would think you'd probably have obviously less profit margin, but you wouldn't have the you wouldn't have the vulnerability you would if you were if you were on your own, you know, developing your own product. But I guess but you ultimately you have control over that as well. Yeah, well, so one so one of the things that when we got to the point where I knew I had to have the a, a lot of the stuff, a lot of these parts were plastic parts, so they had to be injection molded or extruded, and then they had to be assembled. And then the and then the final thing was they had to be filled with a with a filtering material. So the one thing that I would never give up is I let the stuff be injected, molded, and extruded, and then we sent the extrusion parts to the injection molder, and they glued everything or put everything together. Then they sent us the assemblies, and the one thing that we always kept in house was the filling of the material that gave us the ability to have the final look at it final inspection on it the packaging and so that we knew when it went out the door it was always exactly what it, what it was so that's that was that was my way of, of controlling it and that was that was one of the problems is that the packaging stuff when I went to automate some of the packaging stuff I went out and I got prices and it was like anywhere from Two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars to this equipment for packaging stuff, and I said, you know what, I can figure this out. So I spent forty five thousand dollars and I built a packaging line that 
is now eight years old and it's had updates on it, but it's always worked. Thanks, thanks for that insight. Mm -hmm. I, I remember, um, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Milo or, or, or Marsh had any comments because we haven't heard from them yet tonight, but uh, uh, one thing I will say, uh, I remember when I was making model air, radio control model airplane kits, it was like a three year cycle from when I'd come up with a new design before somebody knocked it off, you know, or tried to come up with a similar design to take. Yeah. And so I'd have great sales for about three years and then they would begin to taper for the next two to three years. So there's about a six total six year cycle on these. So you had to have your new plane coming out about the time the sales from the from the previous one were, were on that three year line. Yeah. That's that's um, a that's a really good point, Bill. Yeah. And the only the only way to partially interrupt that process is, is to have a product that's patentable. Then you can you can prolong that a little bit. But well, you're right. You still got to have you, you know you still got to have the development. You got to have that new product. We tried to have either a new product introduction or a major revamp of an existing product at least once every year. The, the problem, Mike, that I ran into was with a um, vacuum cleaner company. And we were making this, it was, it was for Eureka. And it was called the Re 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 Eureka Challenge. And these vacuum cleaners uh, would be stood in uh, on a stand. They checked the static and the dynamic performance. And if the uh, if your old vacuum cleaner, uh, you know, would come in and obviously the Eureka would outperform it and they would sell it. We went for about, and Bill just, just had a flashback, Bill, when you said three years, went three years, we're doing gangbusters. I had my kids packaging these parts to make these demos for the challenge. And the Chinese came in, copied the Eureka vacuum cleaner, yep. made it half the price. And it outperformed it because it was running hot because it had less copper in it, believe it or not. And they didn't put ball bearings in it. All of a sudden, the sales and all of that portion dried up. So my, my lesson on that was once you start it, try to outperform it and then sign your contract such that you get it within the three years or anticipate the people that don't play fair, you can, out, you can outperform them. It's very, very difficult, but uh, it was a hard lesson learned for me. I, I was stuck with 2,800 sheets of plywood. Actually, that that's sort of like the, that that's one of my concerns. And one of the things that I've learned in business is if you, um, if you do want to make something, you don't worry about someone copying you. You need to set up your foundations and your mm -hmm. trust and so on relationship with your customers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is an issue that uh, when you do have a proprietary product, even though you may have copyright, the copyright doesn't seem to hold up at all in China and other no, countries. No. No. Um, so that, that's always an issue. It, it is nice um, and it's it's obviously been successful for Mike. And I guess it depends on the product, um, mm -hmm. how big it is, uh, if it's shippable, the, will the freight kill it, things like that. Will mm -hmm. there be a lo customer loyalty from local uh, customers or will they go to China? Um, and the the rewards are higher but i think um in mike's model also the risks are higher um but the same thing then the reverse of it is is like in the model where i'm heading towards to is, is to do overflow subcontract work or contract uh, uh, work for other customers is all i have to do is just find places where i can get regular various products um, and there might be three months worth of work, there might be two weeks worth of work, you know, but the idea is, and, and there, there still has to be either R&D or, um, or something um, that will make your product stand out from the next. Um, whether you do it or whether somebody else does it, it, it that, that risk is there, but the rewards also are proportional. Yeah. Welcome, uh, Milo. Uh, I see you're on camera. Do you have something you're <laughs> Yeah, I, I do it a little different. I mean, it doesn't, what I bring in doesn't determine whether I eat or not. And so I do strictly custom work. Uh, whatever somebody else is unwilling to do is usually what I end up with. And people say, hey, don't go to him unless you're willing to pay. 
And it's a good thing. They, they know that I'm, I don't have Chinese kids working in my garage. <laughs> and uh, I've actually been doing pretty good with people have an issue or a problem and they can't make it work right. They say, hey, can you see if you can get this to work? And I'll streamline it as much as I can and say, okay, how long is it taking you right now? And by the time we get done, I'll say, well, maybe you're doing the best right now. Well, maybe not. Let's take a look. Uh, one guy in North Carolina, I got him down from 30 minutes of four by eight sheet down to less than nine. Another guy in Seattle, it was taking him about an hour per piece. Right now we're down to six minutes. Uh, you know, that type of thing is, it's, I guess it's, more, it's a more of a business to business type of thing is that I find great pleasure in getting them to work more efficient, you know, but that's what I enjoy doing. Uh, every once in a while, yeah, I just did a run of 90 barley twists, uh, balusters. It was a lot of fun figuring it out. Not so much fun feeding the beast. <laughs> um, can I just sort of ask you there, when, when you do your barley twist balusters and stuff like that, are you doing them double-sided on a rotary axis? Um, well, you know, no, I'm doing them on a rotary axis with form tools. It took This was a 36-inch baluster, two-and-a-quarter-inch round cherry, uh, the twist, I believe, was like 24 inches around. It went three and a half times around. Got it down to about 20 minutes per baluster. And uh, I've got a video out on one of the sites uh, with an ATC machine. You know, it's not a tabletop machine. But... Uh, figuring it out was the fun part. And, of course... Some people that have CNCs are not woodworkers, and some woodworkers are not CNC operators. <laughs> yeah. If you don't understand wood, you usually do everything the wrong way. Not, not Steel is so it. much better. Steel is so much better. <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking with a guy that was describing a problem to me on his aluminum milling machine. And he said it was, I call it the angle of attack of a bit. Came in and it was oscillating until it got settled down. And then it got a side load established. And then it cut smooth. And I said, wait a minute. I just saw the same thing out here on my machine on wood. Doing exactly the same thing. And we got to talking about it. And uh, I said, hey, here's how I fixed it. He went back to his milling machine basically incorporated the same thing and it eliminated the same issue there which i found to be very interesting the guy in seattle that i worked with he said you know i'm finally understanding why you enjoy the development rather than the production because he had done this his whole opinion was i'm doing this for production that's it three pieces now he said I'd be happy to show other people how to do this and let them do the production. So it's whatever a person enjoys because life is still only so long. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to I'm going to tackle a barley twist very shortly. Um, so that's why I was asking you, and and not only that, um, like the I don't know, I'm not a woodworker. I just have to program them and stuff like that. So I don't know what a lot of the, but you know, on the on the stairs, the part that actually go the the curved part on the handrails, um, that's also a um, sought after item, a custom item that people want, and I've got to um, do some programming on that. But we're talking a uh, five axis CNC for that one there. Yeah, the the part that I enjoy the most, and I think. Now I got people doing it just on purpose because they know I'll I'll bite. He said, this can't be done in this software. And I go, oh, yeah. really? <laughs> That's the part I enjoy. Uh, Me too. <laughs> in Vetric, they say, okay, you can't do this. And the most enjoyable conversation, 
I had was with Edward in San Diego. Uh, he's the managing director there, I believe, at uh, Vetri. And he said, you did this on our software. I said, yeah. And you didn't modify the, C uh, the G code coming out. I said, no. He goes, how did you do it? And they showed, you know, I showed a video and he, he did it and he starts laughing. He goes, you wouldn't believe how many people show us what they're doing with our software. And we had no intent that that was going to be done. Yes. And I thought, okay, now, now I'm happy. <laughs> it, it's like guitar necks. Everybody says, no, you can't do a guitar neck in, in, in VCAR Pro. Well, yes, you can. Yep. But you can't do it the way that is conventional. You have to think outside of the box. It's like, you know, any if you can visualize it, you can make it happen in 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 this software. If you've got Milo's talent, <laughs> you know. Well, and sometimes it's by accident, and hope you remember what you did so you can do it again. <laughs> but the first time I cut a thread everything else fell into place because everything else is a version of it. And they said, well, you can't make Vetric software go more than 360 degrees and then 360 back. It's like a washing machine. And I go, yeah, you can. I've got, I sent one issue to Vetric and I said, hey, I'm having an issue here where it throws up random spikes. And I sent them the file, and the vector was, I think, 14,000 inches long. And they said, wait a minute, our software was never intended to do that. I said, wait a minute, you're advertising unlimited size. And they says, yeah, but we've never done this before. I said, it works just fine. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's interesting. But, yeah, Ned... If when you get ready to do a barley twist, I'd be more than happy. It'll it'll amaze you as to how simple it is. Yeah, um, I've I've done a lot of um, 3D carvings, but as you said, it's one thing using a tapered ball nose, like a, a small tapered ball nose, to cut a job. It's another thing to yeah. use a barley twist cutter and other bits where you can do um, where you can do linear paths to actually achieve a larger cut and a faster cut. And um, that's um, I, I've I've actually already done some. Uh, panels and things like that using the various cutters. Uh, one of the uh, companies that I um, uh, do a lot of programming and so on for that I actually set up their machine. I forgot what who it was that said it, but um, basically um, they do, if it's too, I think it was you that said it actually, uh, Milo. Um, he does, he's a Norwegian guy that does all the work that nobody else does. And basically the comment is, if you want it done, he'll do it, but don't expect it cheap. Um, and um, he will do all the one-off jobs and things like that for um, for just learning the um, architectural architectural joiners um, that um, do custom stuff for places. And um, he does a lot of wall panels, which he presses. He makes a lot of money off his pressing. And um, I've now he's getting me to do more and more work for him, and he'll just sit there and run it afterwards. But um, I've done a quite a few large pillars and things like that, which have just been round uh, with some textures and that on them. But um, it's also a challenge for me that I'd like to do a barley twist. Well, the funny part on this one with 90 of these balusters, the guy sent me a picture of the home that it was going into, and it was a multi-million dollar house. And I said, okay, I understand why they want it. And they go, and the contractor that was doing it, he goes, I showed you one picture. How can you tell that's what they were wanting? I said, well, on that wall is one of the African animals with the twisted horns. I said, if you look through the door on that side of the picture, you see a bedpost and those are twisted. I said, there's a lamp in the corner and it is also twisted. It doesn't take a rocket scientist. He goes, I never noticed. <laughs> you know, he was so focused on what he was doing, he didn't see what the customer was wanting. 
And I said, okay, if this is what you're after, then this is the way to do it. But uh, it's kind of fun. So, so, Ned, one of the comments I can make, because I run into this with the burial boxes and on many of the other things I do, is break the problem down into simple pieces. So on a barley twist, I carve literally one part of the corkscrew. And then I put the other piece and intertwine it with it. So you get two, three, four. So I only have to make one part and then I multiply them up. So break your problems down into simpler pieces and glue them together. Um, I've, from, I've seen one or two YouTube videos on it where they basically come in with a barley twist cutter then a smaller quarter inch or whatever to do the inside. Um, and I don't think that'll actually be a problem at all. Um, it was just more so like doing it, uh, do it, doing a helical turn. I've never thought about like actually gluing it, um, et cetera, but yeah. Just, just my point is break the problem down to smaller geometry mm. and then put it all together. Yeah. Well, That's, that, uh, yeah, sorry, okay, sorry. That, that gets into Milo's point of, you know, they never thought you would be able to do this. And most of the time, I don't own a Spire. I, I use other CAD systems, but I use VCarve because it has the full CAM system. And if you break the problem down in smaller pieces, I can piece this all thing together for the one off. And I, I picked up on what Milo's doing there uh, quickly, that he's probably breaking it down into simple pieces. And then you put it all together. I was just testing another uh, theory of a brick a stacked brick pattern on a rotary. And I thought, you know, I can incorporate some G-code in here to manipulate the uh, resetting of the digital readout areas or the resetting of the zero point. I got it down to one vector and I can do the entire thing with eight tool paths. And uh, I finally got it to where I draw one vector. I thought, okay, this is kind of fun. <laughs> I've got to get it documented now because I go, okay, can I do this tomorrow? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> or am I going to forget? But that's that's the enjoyment part. So I've been working out of a log. Um, make sure I'm not muted. I've been working out of a log book for for uh, for years, and. Um, I wonder if I were to share the format of that logbook with you guys, whether that would be something that would be beneficial or helpful to you, where I write down the things, the steps that I did in a project so that two years from now, when somebody asked me to, to repeat that, I have the information in one place. Um, I don't know if that's something. If, I want to help. Anything that has to do with learning, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually Absolutely. started. I've actually started putting the instructions in the Aspire file. Yeah, I started awesome. saying, "Okay, you got to zero this flat side up on the rotary. Uh, this is the post processor I used, and I have my own post processor versions, mm -hmm. and I date them right in the name, so that if I go back in six months, I go, oh, that's the old processor. I better use the new one.' Yeah, but I." will even take screenshots of the, uh, like the spiral gadget setups mm -hmm. and the offsets and the starting points and the ending points. I'll just take a screenshot and throw that in there as well. Cause yeah. Yeah, I'll be lucky if I remember tomorrow, much less than six months from now, what I just did yesterday. Yeah. Aspire has, yeah. Got, <laughs> has gotten very good, um, uh, Vectric products in general have gotten very good with, um, allowing you to place notes inside of the files. They have um, uh, things where you can specify what bit you ordered and, and a, a link so that you can reorder it. Uh, there's uh, a oh, note yeah. section in there that you can just type in the notes like like you were describing, Milo, and and, uh, and things. But you got to train yourself to, you know, to, to remember to do that on these projects. And that's, that's the difficulty. And that's why I have the logbook there because I write it down. Like... Um, Making these these um, uh, edge finders, there's a specific distance I have to go over every time I want to drill the hole. 
And when I originally wrote the program, it it was it was one of those quick one-off G code coding it right at the machine versus <laughs> versus doing it in, in something like Aspire or whatever. And um, that one thing was slowing my production down like crazy because every single time I had to measure probe before uh, before I did the first one of the batch, uh, you know, and that should have been automated like the whole rest of the process, but I didn't do that, you know, and yeah, I've done it now, but little things like that would drive you crazy. And then you try to remember exactly how far over do I get so that I don't actually drill through the hole. Uh, uh, by, by hole, I mean this big hole here. Uh, <laughs> you know, things like <laughs> stupid things, but you got to have that process down. Okay, I, I actually didn't realize what you meant by the log, um, but yeah, I, I, and I'm not a very good documenter of stuff. Um, I, normally, I just do everything like straight on the fly sort of thing, but I actually do do something similar, but I actually put it in the CAD drawing, which then gets picked up by the CAM file, or sorry, the, the CAD drawing gets picked up by the CAM file, but the CAD drawing contains everything the tools, um, the zero points, because I basically work off the, like when I when I set it up for the customer, I work off the bed. So I say, this mm -hmm. is your starting point. These are your, um, like the, your, your waste material around the product, et cetera. Just mm -hmm. things like that. I document it all down for him. Um, so yeah, it's, um, so I was quite surprised to find out that I actually do do that. The problem comes in when you name your files similar things. Uh, you know, and it's six months later and you're going and you grab the first one and it might be version one instead of version 15 or, or, or whatever. And you get completely different results. It's, why is that chamfer not there? Or why is that this or that not there? And you have to go back and look. But if you've written it down, if you have your 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 your, your logbook there or you have it in your in your CAD files, then, you know, as, it, as long as you have meaningful names and some way of telling what date. Um, well, that's yeah. that's one thing that I found is while I'm doing design work, et cetera, um, is I don't delete and overwrite CAD files as I progress on. I just progress on the version number. Um, um, so basically what I'll do is um, I'll start off with version one and I'll use version one and then I'll use, a, I, I apply this from the software side of things for major and minor revisions. So I'll use version one when I start off and I've got an idea, then I'll go like 01, 02, 03, 04, 05, 07, 20, 30, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, if I do a major change, and I'll keep a progressive save of all of them, and then if I do a major change, I'll then change from one to two, um, and then I'll start again while I'm developing something. Um, generally, this comes with the um, with most of the 3D work, or if I'm actually designing a product for somebody, that's sort of like what I'll do, and that's very handy. But every time it comes to a major point where it actually is going to the CNC, I will document the cutters, the uh, the datum, and things like that. Yep. Nice. All right, folks, we're uh, reaching that time. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation tonight, and I, I think it was useful uh, to some folks to maybe think about the fact that, yeah, you really can set a goal and pay off your machine if you want to, but you got to be methodical about it. And it's obvious mm -hmm. from all the people who were here, most of them had already done it. So if you're out there and you're, you're wondering how you're going to tackle this, it can be done. Talk to any of us. We'll be glad to help you think through the project or the process um, and, and know that it can be done and then you can do things. Uh, right. Does anybody have any um, closing thoughts or comments before we uh, call it a night? All right. This is the CNC Router Tips group on Facebook, hashtag CNC Router Tips. Every Wednesday, at 7 p.m. Eastern, we get together and we discuss things that are CNC related. This is the first time we've had a planned topic ahead of time. Um, so <laughs> it was kind of an interesting show to see us bounce all around and, and get it done. But uh, I do appreciate those of you who took the time to tune in and, and listen to this and uh, those who came on. 
and we'll be back next Wednesday uh, to do it again. Thank have you. A great night. Um, and just just, just, just a quick a one. Drink. Hang on. Uh, and I, sorry, I thought your name was Beba. Sorry, it's Beba. Um, yeah, because you're Beba, having time. Yeah. So, and Milo, that's yes. some of my rotary access work in the background. Where I've been sort of like popping up some of the stuff I've been doing. Very good. Very cool. All right, everyone. Hope you have a wonderful, uh, a wonderful day. Bye. Bye. Yeah, too. Have See a good you next night. time, guys. Thank you.